All right, everyone, welcome along. So we're approaching the end, aren't we? We've kind of covered really what it is in terms of what a single pane of glass does and the benefits that it will bring to your business. But what I think we've struggled to do, what I think a lot of people are still going to struggle with really understanding is where the massive benefit comes from and really also where the disconnect comes from in terms of what's going on within my organization, what are we doing, why is what this why is what Ross says so different to the normal message that we seem to be getting from the other areas, the other channels, the other resources that we've got? Is Ross completely wrong? Let's have a look and we'll talk about it today, okay, and really understand the theory. And hopefully you'll understand really that we're not saying anything different to what anyone else is. It's more we're kind of filling in the gaps and the just the bits that seem to be just they get missed, really, is probably more of it. Because what goes on with a single pane of glass is much more about that methodology and the mindset that you embed within your organization of what you're going to do with your Power BI infrastructure and architecture. So I thought we start here, okay? With a whiteboard let's talk a little bit about really what it is we mean and kind of what's going on with this idea and what do what what really happens as we start talking about a single pane of glass because really most commonly what it comes down to is the idea within an organization that we want to build a sales dashboard for example okay so we want to build something around sales and so in order to do that, we end up building vertically and we build a nice sales report, okay, vertically on the sales channel, okay? And that then becomes our use case one. That's kind of what's happened. And that's what drives Power BI into a business. So some bright spark has gone, oh, you know, I've, I've had a look at this. I've watched some videos from Geordi Intelligence because like those guys really know what they're doing. Or, you know, I've gone and I've attended a course or I've gone and I've, I've done this. That's common. So we've got a channel, we've got a vertical column, haven't we, for reporting. And this is what happens time and again. So then somebody says, oh, that'd be amazing. I wish I could do that within, like, our manufacturing side. So they say, yeah, no problem. We can do that in manufacturing. So they go down and they build their thing in manufacturing. And it's another separate column. And it's separate, isn't it? The two are separate. They're treated separately. Because that's how we were talked about. That's how we discussed it. That's what happened with use case one when we brought it through. We built this single thing that came through as one entity. That was the right thing to do, wasn't it? Surely. Why would we do something different? The challenge with this is, if you go down this route, and I'll be honest with you, this is the bit that's most important that you understand with this route. This is how traditional reporting is done. Okay, you go, you report on a system. You go, you buy a new tool tomorrow. So our HR team, HR and finance, say, oh, you know, HR and finance, what should we go and buy? If only there was an HR and finance tool out there who, that we could use that would be able to allow us to bring everything under one roof so that we're not having to have multiple ones like the other guys have. Okay, so they go and they find their platform that does it. And that platform, in all its sales pitch, says, oh, we've got all the reporting analysis that you could possibly want. Why would you want anything else? Okay, so, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that because that, as I say, is kind of what happens with every platform that I'm seeing these days. So you go, you buy your new platform that does everything and it's kind of there as a ring-fenced area again. And the issue with all this is, is that it hasn't actually brought you any real benefit into your organization. So as an organization, you're still very much limited and curtailed by this columnar way of thinking. Okay, you haven't broken down the walls, as it were. You haven't broken down the barriers and established that core construct of data. Okay, so what would we say or we recommend that you would do is a bit different. Okay, now if we went back to our finance and HR thing, where we bought a single platform that has everything all under one, all under one roof and is great. Okay. What we would effectively be saying is, well, we're going to use that, but we're going to use connectors into it to get our data out that we're going to use as a, for something else. 
Likewise, we go and bought a new manufacturing tool or a new sales tool or whatever else you've got. Okay, they will come these days with, oh, we've got an analytics package. Okay, or really it's now analytics and AI. That seems to be the way it goes now. So really what should we be doing about that? What we should do is, is quite simple. So if we remove all these that we've put in, okay, because what we would say is, we would look and say, right, what ETL processes are we gonna to need to do for these? And this is something that, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with our example where we've gone, okay? So I typically say kind of, and this is just me, ETL based on a process or a platform, okay? So ETL three, go there, okay? Finance and HR. Okay, so we end up with three ETL pipelines. Okay, so you'd have one for your sales, one for your manufacturing, one for your finance and HR. Okay, that's just a ballpark. You might look into this and say, oh, we need another two or three, we need different things. Okay, these ETL pipelines could be in anything. All right, that's something else to consider and to understand. Okay, but really this is where you are extracting from the production system. So from our lovely finance and HR system that comes with everything included, including AI and blah, blah, blah. From our sales pipeline that now has amazing AI and analytics built into it. Oh, it's amazing, it's great. Okay, we're extracting that data and we're putting it somewhere else, okay, into our analytics platform, into our main data platform. Okay, I'm saying data platform because there's more to data than just analytics. If you want to do AI, you need to be able to surface that data in a way that it can actually start to interact with more than just one process. AI benefits not from just looking at one, but from looking at multiple. So you need to establish a data platform. So ETL processing, that could be traditional data flows, that could be going down PySpark into Fabric into a traditional data warehouse, it could be going into an Azure data warehouse or an Azure SQL data warehouse. Could we go into a data lake house, okay? These are your options that are available to you. And really it's up to you as a business to kind of work out what it is. And especially when you say, well, but we just started with a sales dashboard. So this is why so much of the content that we discuss and what we talk about is around, let's start with data flows because that's the, the right data entry point for a business. In terms of the realities for a company, what we see in terms of the progression is that a company, let's put, so let's put this in here, progress into Power BI, okay? So you will start with Excel, Power BI Desktop, Power BI Pro, and then Power BI Premium. And I'll put in brackets per user, okay? Because you may be like, if you're a large company, you might say, well, you know, we're, we're not gonna do PPU. It's not cost effective, okay? And that now is becoming, or has become, so we'll remove that. So I'll put PPU stroke fabric, because that's really the way, where the position is now with Microsoft. Okay. What they're technically saying is, if you're big enough now that you would look at P, uh, premium capacity, it's fabric. Um, PPU is an interesting one though, as I say, because it's kind of a difficult challenge. But anyway, we're, gonna, we, we're digressing. So because you're gonna start with Excel, where can I start with Excel? So we would say Excel, you can use Power Query within Excel to actually start to leverage far better pivot tables and pivot charts within your organization. Once that starts to become a bit of a, oh, it's a bit of a faff doing it, use Power BI Desktop, okay? You can start to automate stuff with that. Once you can show to the business, well, actually, this is the benefit of it, you'll get your Power BI Pro subscriptions then, so you can then start to automate some factors of it. And then only if you start getting either too big or you're running into it, you'll start to drift into PPU or fabric space. Okay? That's the typical progression that we see with our clients. That's where we would recommend people go. So ETL and ETL1 would likely be something in data flows, would be where we'd recommend, because that's pro compatible. So you've gone with your Power BI Pro, we've, we've gone data flows. It could well still be that we're using Excel 
or even Power BI Desktop. I was thinking about that this morning. It's entirely possible for an organization to use the free price of admission of Power BI in terms of Power BI Desktop to get started. You can build quite detailed manufacturing, or sorry, not manufacturing, quite detailed reports for senior leadership teams, copy and paste them into PowerPoint, but they look much better in terms of your workflow process, you're going in, you're hitting refresh, and it's pulling everything together from the various sources you've laid out. And that's free, okay, that's no cost to it. So you can actually get, do quite a lot already with it. And you would transition, in this case, into Power BI Pro, sorry, Power BI Desktop as opposed to Excel, because Power BI Desktop allows you to have a data model and serve out multiple things from it much more easily than Excel does allow you to do it. Although Excel Power Query and Power Platform, Power Pivot, sorry, allow you to build kind of a proper data model, and then you can have multiple pivot tables and charts linking into it. But the whole layout, it's, yeah, anyway, it looks a bit better in my personal view if you do it in Power BI Desktop versus what you can do in Excel. Although I'm sure there are Excel aficionados out there who will say, Whoa. okay, key thing. We've done that, we've built that as our single thing that I've built in my land, this is me, I have done it, ta-da, okay? And suddenly we're being told to do something different. So of course, it's natural that you'll do the same for ETL2, okay? So what we would want you to do is to actually start to say, well, what we're gonna do now is build a different shape, shall we? Okay. So on day one, your semantic model will have started here. Okay, going through. And in terms of the size of it, it'll be like that, won't it? It's just going straight up from one area. And what we're saying now is, well, we're bringing in manufacturing. So what we would say is, well, let's bring it across here and then we start to take oh, this through into there. Okay, so it's expanded. We've actually said, right, we've, we've got this semantic layer expanded. And likewise then, when we do the finance and HR side, we look to again, bring that up into our semantic model, okay? And what we find is that this will become a semantic model layer because you might find that you actually have to semantic models, okay? But I can spell some semantic models. Because in terms of this, for all, we've got finance and HR, right? and it would be really important for us to understand who's on the factory floor. You know, who are we paying on the factory floor? Who are we paying on the, in the sales front? And you know, what's the total cost of that? But the details of that employee in terms of, oh, well, Ross lives here, probably, we wouldn't want that in like the main semantic model that we were using. So we'd have a restricted access semantic model as well, at least for this area. But overall staff costings, you'd want to be able to bring through. Okay, and you would work out ways of dealing with that depending on your regulations and actually what's needed. But probably you'd look at kind of headcount numbers at a department division level. Again, depends on how many people you've got, all those kind of things, because PII and yeah. But anyway, so we've built this semantic layer now with two models. So really the next part, let's change the color of this now, now we've got our semantic layer, is we want to say, well, you know, how do we report on this? So let's build reports, okay? So what we're saying, or what I've been saying, is, well, actually what we do is we structure it based on function, okay? So we could say, this is our senior leadership team. Senior leadership team, we could have our department heads, and we could have, let's just say, for the sake of argument, manufacturing workers, okay? Because there's no reason not to. Right? But what the, where the power of Power BI comes from, as I say, in all these silly terms that we use, is that because these 
are all effectively fed by the same semantic model there, okay, you've got that single pane of glass. Yeah? Okay, our semantic model layer is that single pane of glass that we've got. In terms of where we're telling people to go and get report content and where everyone surfaces report content up from, it is one area. So our senior leadership team will go to one location and they will see all the report content they need regardless of if it's related to sales, manufacturing or finance and HR. Okay? Likewise, our department heads will go and we can use filtering within that to actually bring down and limit and manage what it is they're seeing. We can use, if needs be, row level security options to actually manage what they can see and who does what and how it all fits together. And then lastly, obviously, of course, we have our workers coming in to the same point to see their same data. So we've built this, you've seen this, haven't you? It's not the prettiest thing, okay? But this is an example of what you can do or what we would look to do for our senior leadership team. So this is our senior leadership team's view. And they've got in, in here, this is the New York data sets that we've got, but this could be, so we've got our sales data, we've got our um, <coughs> manufacturing, and then we've got our finance and HR data off over to one side. And further over, you can have other things, okay? The layout, the structuring of these is all completely dynamic though. So it could be based on what you want. We could, for all we're saying that we've, that we've doing it this way, we said, well, look, in theory, we could look and do down the borough route. We'll show you the borough one as we get further through with it. And we'll do, when we look at it next week, when we look at the full using it in anger side of it. So you've got these structures that you can overlay and piece together but it all always comes back to, we are gonna use the same semantic model or model set for everything. And that semantic model layer has a place that it will exist. And then it becomes, okay, so, so we're talking more about the ETL side, bringing it through to the semantic layer, and we're talking about the reporting side, but the key bit, the important bit is that semantic modeling layer. And that's where you should be thinking and where you need to consider. And I hope you can see that this is where the challenges are for a lot of people when they start to think about, well, what do I do with Power BI? Because if I went back and said, well, let's look at what one of our lovely examples that we've looked at in the past. So in the past, where we've looked at the England food hygiene, we've built, and you've, you've watched this, we've done a whole series on building up this one report pack. So it's entirely natural for you to think, well, then next report pack, we'll, we'll build it up the same. And I think this is the challenge that a lot of people have and that a lot of it's, it makes it really difficult to kind of explain the real benefits of Power BI when we just do these solution based video series, CREI series, comments down below. Um, when actually what you're thinking is or what we need you to understand is much more in terms of let's back up this structure here that you want that you want that semantic reporting layer to be the key piece and surfacing more up to it is the goal and as i say one of the things for me is really important is that you think i want one semantic model okay in my data set or in my environment one okay always think to yourself how can i get to one okay the realities as i've as i've discussed already like we'd need to bring in hr data you might never be able to do it okay, within your organization. That's not a problem. The key thing is that you've questioned and you've had that discussion about saying, we want one and that has to be what we do. Okay? Champion. So what do you reckon then? The challenges of getting to that point where you've got a single pane of glass report methodology established within your organization, uh, they are, there's a lot of them, and it is a complex thing to work through. It's a very difficult one to really fully explain and get buy-in from senior leadership teams. Can be, it can be difficult because, well, they just want to see one thing. And in terms of integrating it in to an existing semantic model, that can add a layer of complexity to it. Certainly that use case too, especially the first time you integrate something into a data model, 
it can be challenging to say the least right and it's one of those things that definitely you may find well i need some help with it once you get to use case three four five it kind of becomes kind of second nature because by that point you start to improve other aspects of it so one of the things that you'll start to piece together is things like well we need a core calendar table we need a core geography table presumably we need a core insert other table here and those might not be rad readily apparent from use case one so use case two will be a lot of support information that has to come through and be integrated into the whole package so by the time you get to use case three four five you, you know you, the, that support data side is becoming less and less prevalent you find you've got a far greater crossover of data and it becomes more likely that it's just the odd fact table and the odd dimension, well, a fact table and the odd dimension table that need to be added for additional processes as opposed to a whole raft of additional tables and integrations. The benefits, though, are clear, okay? If you're pushing people to one location and one location only, it, it's much easier for them to do that. When you start to integrate the full 0365 suite in, though, with what it does and how it integrates into it, it becomes clear that this is definitely what you should be doing, okay? There is no doubt that this is the right way to go. The challenge is always, how do I take that or embed that principle so that we make the right choice when use case two comes along? How can I make sure that as I'm doing use case one, I'm comfortable enough that I can deliver a use case two into the same model? Or, if is and isn't uncommon, as part of my continual improvement cycles of use case one, I integrate in use case two. So, what do I mean by that? Early in my Power BI side, I built um, a use case one for a FTSE 100. And I'll be honest, never, they did not believe it was use case one. Okay, and I think that's something, there's a lesson in there. Use case one is not always what you think use case one is. Okay, not trying to blow my own trumpet. That's just the realities of it. It became clear down the line that use case one was that report pack that had been built. But as part of that, I iterated through three or four different four different versions in three years of it and in terms of the model itself and the model itself was removed and replaced over time large scale model upgrades like that you will do them but what you will start to find is that as you're progressing it becomes less and less frequent so i would do a major model upgrade annually would be the the things that we would do and it would only be if there were functional, not functional, if there were structural changes required, yeah, functional, I suppose, functional and structural changes that were required to the model by emerging requirements. So, oh, we need this. Oh, crap, that's going to be integrated into it. We need that. Oh, that's got to be integrated into it. And, you know, oh, well, we actually, the way we developed it, that's going to be really complicated to do. But we can do a scheduled upgrade in two or three months, and it'll be integrated then. These are all things that it's easy enough to do as you leverage and show it because you've then got a more structured way of working and that is of course the the downside of this or the challenge that you'll find with it that that single semantic layer that you have suddenly becomes really heavy in terms of oh, that we need to make changes we need to tweak it it's there's time to it so you need to wrap proper change management and change controls around that but that's important too you know this is something that all business reporting is running from no one's going to tell us oh no, no, no. you might get some grumbles but power bi has got your back with that in that you can write dax within a thin report so if you've got a new set of measures that are urgently required you can deliver them immediately they might need a month or a couple of weeks or whatever it is before they're going to be available within the main model or before they're going to be as in an optimized op solution. But it's there almost immediately because you can. So the agility of the platform is there to help you as well. Okay. If you want to have a conversation about this, do. You know, so you know this is Geordie Consulting. I'm happy to help you. Email us, office at geordieconsulting.co.uk will happily help you 
move through the use case one to whatever and how to really embed the principles that are going to help you, your business succeed with its Power BI deployment and make sure really that you optimize the benefit proposal of it and minimize the spend profile of your, pro of your program. Okay. For now though, stay safe, take care, ta-da. <laughs>